This is the recording for the Unit 4 post lab. So, of course, the first question is simply that you attended the lab intensive. Then, center of mass, so that's the one with the mobile. Torques are important for an applied in machines and so on. Knowledge of an object center of mass um, is important in order to apply torques properly and to balance objects. Both of these are actually kind of an understatement because there are many, many more examples where torques need to be applied properly and where you have to see how an object is balanced through its center of mass. All right, let's see. For that particular experiment, the measurements that you had to take, you had to measure the length of each string. That's not true. I believe none of the strings were measured. They, their length do not affect the stability of the mobile itself. But this is what you had to measure. You had to determine the mass of each rod. You had to measure distance between each pivot point in the middle of the rod suspended and this one and this one and this one. And again, if you reflect, you will see that's what you got there. For this one, for this calculation here, look at the sheet, the data sheet where it computes the torques. So multiply the mass times the lever arm times gravity, convert because of the grams and centimeters, and you get the torque. Look at what I say here about the correct sign, so plus or minus. This one here is uses the long equation for the center of mass. You have three masses given here and three lever arms and you multiply each mass times its lever arm and so on. Just follow the equation and at the end what you should come up with is something that's going to be really close to 0, 0.0 because that tells you that the mobile in fact is balanced because the center of mass coincides with the pivot point. Okay, the errors for this lab, measuring an assembly whose rods are tilted, you probably try to make it as horizontal as possible. Measuring the lever arms, you probably used a ruler and measure to the closest millimeter. Hopefully you did that. For getting to the scale, measuring the masses, well, you probably used an electronic scale, so you had a very tiny error on that one, and all of these just these three hours combined here, all of them are very, allow for very accurate measurements. And therefore, in this experiment, it was really expected to, that you came up with really accurate results. And then the conclusion, well, you say that you type in the conclusion and send it to us. Okay, then the other one, centripetal force, what I just said about the accuracy for the torque lap or center of mass lap or mobile lap, that's not applicable to the centripetal force in the way that it was done. A centripetal force lap could be done with very good e equipment and you come up with very good results. But this is another lab where I wanted to show that, well, if you do it as casually as we're doing it, yeah, you have to really pay attention to the errors that you could that, that you could encounter, and I'm going to get to these here in just a moment. So here is the motivation against look look at the lab manual. Here I did a little bit better. I I know that I mentioned quite a few more examples for centripetal force as compared to earlier for torques and center of mass. Concepts for centripetal force. I believe they are in the correct order for the most part. So which force supplies the centripetal force on the tires of a car driving through a turn? Static friction. Which force is centripetal force on the wheels of a locomotive? It's the horizontal support force from the tracks towards the center of the turn. Lab manual procedures that the mass rotates virtually horizontal. Why is this not possible? Well, because the weight pulls it down. So obviously the string is going to sag down. Why was it necessary to measure an average force? Nobody's able to rotate the mass at a constant speed and 
also the string hooked itself a little bit on the tube up there. You might have noticed that. And the force measurement probably gave you the largest error of, of all those errors that are in here. Why should the object on the string be rotated horizontally, not vertically? Well, here's the long explanation. If you were to rotate it vertically, let's see. Oh, hold on. Is that the one? The weight. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you were to rotate it vertically, then on the top, gravity and tension are pulling the weight down, while at the bottom, tension is pulling it up, gravity is pulling it down. So the two directions of forces change all the time, and that would make it really tough to get a good force measurement. At least by doing it horizontally, you got some kind of average, which still produced a relatively large random error. Let's see, mentioning the fictitious centrifugal force every time I hear that word. I'm cringing because people misapply it all the time, or do you say they apply it the wrong way? Oh gosh, there is no such thing as centrifugal force. Was completely void in the theory and lab procedure. Which direction does the applied force really act? Well, it really acts inward. It's the tension that keeps the weight rotating around the center. And if somebody cut the string, the weight would not fling outward. No, it would actually fling tangentially to the circle that I was making because of its own inertia, which is the answer to the next question. There you go. If the string broke, the answer is inertia. I think the remaining ones here are also in the correct order. So for example, if there really was a centrifugal force, what would the acceleration be and how would the rotating mass move? And what would happen is zero in a constant velocity, which means it goes in a straight line, a constant velocity. That's clearly not the case for objects that are changing directions. And let's see if there really was. Okay, I just did that. People occasionally use the term when centrifugal force was crying. Why? Oh, yeah, I should put a lot of centrifugal force in here, even though I do not like that term at all. I hate it. Why is the term centrifugal actually incorrect? Let's see what that was here. There just is absolutely no outward pointing force acting on an object that follows a curved path. Yes. I totally agree with that. Of course, I wrote, I wrote that. And look at the others here. Uh, why is the term stable force actually correct? Well, because the force on an object that follows curved path points inward and so on. And yeah, look at the others. All right, this one here tests that you understood the equations that were used in this particular lab. You can plug these all in into this long equation. But you can also use the Excel sheet and plug in these numbers there and have Excel do the work for you. All right, so triple force errors. There were quite a few more. I counted a total of seven. Let's see if that's true. So not keeping the tape right beneath the tube. Yep. Estimating the angle, forgetting to tear the scale, measuring the masses, miscounting the number of rotations, radius of the rotating objects, measuring times with the stopwatch and reaction time. That's actually one of the labs where you did measure the time. Many others where things were moving, you actually didn't. Uh, measuring the forces with the spring scale, yeah, that's, again, as you notice, probably the most inaccurate error. And did I come up with seven here? I believe I did, right? And oh, there's one more, so conclusion here. Again, the statements over here on the left-hand side are in the correct order, which means that the first one here is list the results or examples of the results, like I did here. Then compare the results to published value. In this case, there are no published values. So what you do is you compare the centripetal force that you calculated that it should be to the one that you actually measured and see how far you're off free with these two val um, values. Let's see, they compare very favorable. Oh yeah, that's an assessment of the data. And then besides confirming the equation, there were no further outcomes, okay, for the centripetal force and so on. 
any while. Let's see what they are right here. Perhaps that the string didn't break and the inertia of the object flying off tangentially and damaging something was a nice side effect and further outcome. In previous year, occasionally, as I told people, move away from the glass doors, move away from cars. I, I still had people really close to the glass door. And then I finally said, OK, I'm not going to use washers anymore. I'm just going to use the rubber stoppers and still tell people to put some distance in between. And then the last one here, I believe this is the last statement. Whoa, it's a long one. Yeah, because it's about errors. So this one here, it's about errors. OK, that was the recording for the unit for post-labs.